My wife, Carrie, just uh, ducked out of the service. She's going to children's church because we, we brought with us as we came home from Honduras, which th this nation, we love this nation so much. We've been working there many years. And we brought Honduran money, uh, one Limpira bills. So Limpira is their dollar. And uh, we're giving each of our kids in children's ministry over there one Limpira and it's Honduras money and asking them to pray for that third world country, that impoverished country. So when your child comes home with one of those one Limpira bills, know that they are on our prayer team and we're praying for that, the people in that foreign country, praying that God will bless Honduras. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. We love Honduras. All right, turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Psalm 14 in verse 1. Psalm 14 in verse 1. Father, I thank you today that the word of God is a seed that planted in our heart brings forth a harvest of righteousness, healing, miracles, faith, and truth. Lord, may we walk in the truth. You said to, uh, through John, you have no greater joy than to hear that your children walk in truth. Today, we receive your truth in scripture, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Psalm 14 in verse one. David, ministering as a prophet inspired by the Holy Spirit, said these cutting words. This makes this very direct declaration. He was not being politically correct. He was not even trying when he said this. Listen to what he said. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Uh, it is even more direct in the ERV version. It reads this way. Only fools think there is no God. People like that are evil and do terrible things. They never do what is right. Jesus said, However, in Mark eleven twenty two, 22, have faith in God. Say that with me, have faith, have faith in God. So Jesus said that we should believe in God. David said that those who don't are foolish, that they'll end up doing terrible things and foolish things and abominable works. We're living in a day where the Christian faith is under an, uh, uh, the, perhaps the greatest attack of all history. So many people uh, attack the, 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 the gospel, attack the truths of the word of God, attack the, 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 the fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith. So many people in our day, because it's become quite popular to, to declare themselves agnostics or atheists. Agnostics say, I don't know whether there's a God or not. Atheists are more firm in their conviction. They believe definitely there is no God. Uh, and people often talk about their doubts. And people talk about their unbelief. And uh, just put it on out there. And, and they give us their reasons for not believing in the existence of God. And you know, to be fair, they've got some pretty good reasons a lot of times. Some reasons that are hard to argue against for their disbelief in God. And how many of you know that all of us have struggled with this issue in life? We have all, all of us have faced the bombarding thoughts of what if there is no God? Is there really a God? Does God even exist? And if God does exist, why does this happen and that happen and the other happen? Why all the pain? Why all the suffering? Why, why all of the evil if there is a God? I personally, even though I grew up in church, I was a, I was a baby in the nursery in a Baptist church when I was a, just under a year old. I, I've been in church almost all my life, except for maybe a couple of years of waywardness and backsliding and youthful lust. But for most of my life, I've been in church. I'm a minister of the gospel for 42 years. I've pastored for 40 years. And yet I have the challenges. I've had the challenges in my own mind. Is there really a God? We all struggle with that. To be honest, we've all struggled with that issue. But I, I've come to the conclusion in my own mind and in my own heart that there is a God, that the God we read about in the Bible is the true and the living God. And uh, I've come to that conclusion not just because I want to believe in God, 
but because I have encountered evidence, real and what I believe is concrete evidence that there is a God. You see, the atheists, uh, they have a theory. The agnostics have a question. But we Christians, we have evidence for what we believe. And I want to share some of that evidence this morning. I'm, I'm going to share five evidences for why I believe in God. We hear a lot about what we should do and, and uh, what we should believe. But I think we need more teachings on how are we going to accomplish what we're supposed to do and how can we believe and why. What is the why of our belief? I want to talk about why I believe in God. I'm going to give you five evidences. Here's the first one. Evidence number one is creation itself. Everybody say creation. creation. Listen to the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 1, verse 19. He says, what can be known about God is clear to them or clear to people because he has made it clear to them. From the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, they have all been clearly observed in what he made. As a result, people have no excuse. Paul here says that what can be known about God, his qualities, his power, his nature, all of that can be clearly observed in and through what he has made. In other words, creation, is an ev creation itself is an evidence of the reality and the existence of of God, creation. Think about the universe. The universe, we're still discovering the universe. It's still expanding. It's as if when God said, let there be light and began to create, that, that, that that's still being carried out. This universe is growing larger and larger, the scientists tell us. We're still discovering parts of the universe we never knew existed. And the really intriguing thing about the universe is that it works so Perfectly, It's so predictable, except for an occasional unexpected asteroid. Most of all of the universe really works perfectly like a giant timepiece. In fact, it's so perfect. You know, when I was a, a, a little boy in grade school, I first learned about Halley's Comet. How many of you are familiar with Halley's Comet? It, it, it comes by the earth and is visible once every 75 years. And then 75 years later, here it comes again. And then 75 years later, just like clockwork, here it comes again. 75 years later, here it comes just like clockwork, here it comes again. I remember being in grade school and thinking, I'm, I want to look at that comet. I want to see Halley's Comet when it comes through. And it was to come through in 1986, which was several years after I graduated high school. But I made up my mind, I'm going to see it now. I don't remember what I was doing that night in 1986. In fact, I don't remember much of the 80s at all. I remember big hair and some of the music, but... <laughs> I, I, the older you get, the more blurred everything. Yeah, I don't remember, but I know I missed it. And, I, and folks, I missed it, but it's not going to come around again until 2061. I'm probably going to miss it again unless we can see it from heaven. Uh, I, I, I missed Halley's Comet, but I'm telling you, it's just like clockwork. The whole universe is just like clockwork, just like clockwork. You can set, in fact, you can set your times, but in fact, we do set our clocks by it. We set our clocks by the giant clock that God made called the universe. Can you imagine a fine gold pocket watch just, autumn, just coming together, just evolving out of nothing and, bum, 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 and a gold pocket watch that told time almost perfectly? Could that happen? Is that really feasible? Could that ever happen? And yet we're looking at the most perfect timepiece ever concocted, the universe. And that creation tells me there's a creator behind it. The human body, some people will say it's a, it's a miracle of nature. Others of us say it's a miracle of God, but it's certainly a miracle. The way the body works, the way all the processes and, 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 the, and the organs and, and the, the, the systems of the human body where the, the natural healing power in the body to heal itself. If you, if you ever, ever doubt the, 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 one, the wonderful aspects and the miraculous aspects of the human body, just talk to a doctor or a nurse about the, how the body works together. 
there's no doubt to me that we were made in God's image, that God made our bodies to function like they function in a miraculous way. It is made with genius design. Intelligent design necessitates an intelligent designer. I, I believe that with all of my heart. Think about nature itself. Think about how does an acorn become an oak? How, how does the moon control the waves, the tides of the oceans? The wonder of a beehive <laughs> or the lion's pride and how they hunt their prey and how their culture is created by instinct. Have you... Have you ever been scuba diving or snorkeling? Have you ever seen the world that's under the sea? What a marvelous creation that is. Have you ever walked through a flower garden? Could you really doubt the existence of God? Have you ever walked out at midnight and looked at the clear Texas sky and said to yourself, mm, no, there's no God. It's just practically impossible. I think the fact that uh, of the wonder of creation tells me there's a wonder working God up there somewhere that created, that created all of this. Paul talks about this again. He's preaching to idolaters. To, for people, he's preaching that the people in the Gentile world should believe in the true and the living God, the creator of all things. It's found in Acts 14. I'll just uh, read it to you. Uh, Paul says to his audience on this one occasion, he said, God did not leave himself without witness. In the ERV, it reads this way, God was always doing the good things that prove he is real. God was always doing the good things that prove he is real. Back to the King James. God didn't leave himself without a witness. He did good. He gave us rain from heaven. He gave us fruitful seasons. And he filled our hearts with food and gladness or joy. Now just think about that statement for a moment. He said God has proven himself as real in that he does good. Think about all the good things that happen in the human experience. Think about all the good things. He gives us rain from heaven. How many of you know because of that rain we eat? Because of that rain, we're given fruitful seasons. And he's not just talking about crops or agriculture. You're in your life, there are fruitful seasons. You know? You know, you don't bear much fruit when you're four or when you're 104. But how many of you know when you're 34, that's a fruitful season in your life? And he says he fills our lives with food and with joy. And think about the joy. Think about the glad. Think about love. Come on, you go to movies on Saturday night to think about love. Can I talk about love on Sunday morning? Think about romance. Think about that ushy-gushy feeling when you fall. Come on, that has to be a gift from God. Think about art. Think about music. Think about pl the pleasures of life. The food. The fun. The fellowship. Think about all the good things. I know people come up and they say, if there's, if there's a God, how can all this evil exist? Well, I'm gonna answer a question with a question. If there's not a God, how can all this good exist? Come on, somebody. All the goodness is an evidence of God. You say, well, what about the evil? Well, the Bible explains that. We do have an enemy, the enemy of God. He's called Satan, and he's doing his best to destroy and deface the human race because he hates God and hates the image of God that we bear. Oh, there, there are explanations of why suffering and evil exist. You'll only find a suitable explanation in the scripture. God, this good loving God must have an enemy who seeks to destroy every good thing that God has, has created. If we'll learn to take the scripture at its word, all of the real answers that we need to live life are found there. And that brings me to evidence number two, which is the scripture itself. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. When I say scripture, I'm talking about the Holy Bible, Old and New Testaments, this revelation written of God's thoughts, God's words, God's intentions, God's will. He said all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable for teaching, for proof, for proof bearing, or reproof means to prove things for correction and for instruction in righteousness. You know, you get to thinking about this book and how it's written and what it says. It, it has, some, it has some, some 
really extreme statements within its pages. For instance, there's one place in the Bible where, it's, where God says, Be ye perfect, for I am perfect. What human being would write that? No, human beings, we're, we're all about making excuses for ourselves. We're, we're, we're all about leaving room for our, our mistakes, our errors, and our sins. But God comes along, this perfect God, and said, my will is that you be perfect, that you be whole, that you be complete. My will, my perfect will, is that you be like me. Men wouldn't have written that. This, this book, 66 books within these pages, written by 40 different men, all inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the wonderful agreement, the cohesiveness, the, the, all of the, the wonder of the scriptures is really an amazing thing. Now, I get it that it's a complex book. It's big. There are difficult passages to understand. I get it that there are seeming contradictions. There, I said it. I admit it. There are some things that look like they're contradictory. However, if we will study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, the truth is most every one of those contradictions can be explained and you can get to the root of the problem and you can discover that mm, we just hadn't read enough, we haven't researched enough, we just haven't learned enough to, to see that these really are no contradictions at all. Now I've not worked them all out, but I've worked most of my contradictions that I've found out just by being a dutiful, consistent Bible student. But even though there are seeming contradictions. That does not explain away all of the perfection, all of the revelation, all of the common threads, all of the wonder of this book. Take, for instance, the hundreds of prophecies that have been literally fulfilled about just Jesus himself, the prophecies of his conception, of his virgin birth, of his miracle life of perfection and always obeying the Father and never breaking the rules and never breaking the laws of Moses. How about the fact that it was prophesied, his death was prophesied. His gruesome, bloody death was perfectly illustrated by Isaiah hundreds of years before it happened. How about the fact that the Old Testament predicts his resurrection from the dead? It predicts the Gentile program of grace. Everything about Jesus' life, hundreds of prophecies predicted them years, many hundreds of years before he lived. The first, the first one I can find is in Genesis 3.15 where God said, I'm going to send someone and, he is, uh, the, the, and, the, and the serpent is going to bruise his heel, but this someone is going to crush his head. That came to pass 4,000 years later when Jesus went to the cross and defeated Satan on our behalf. All of the prophecies were fulfilled having to do with Jesus' first coming and his suffering and his death and his resurrection. And I, and I dare say God's prophetic words that he's coming again will also be literally fulfilled. Jesus is coming back and he's coming real soon. And people will see that this Bible is true and inspired by God and that there is a God in heaven who's gonna show himself openly. Every eye shall see him. Oh yeah. Every knee shall bow before him and confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believers do it right now. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap. Believers, we do it right now. One of the most amazing prophecies in the scripture, I'm talking about the evidence of scripture, is one found in Daniel 9. You can Google it when you get home. It's an amazing thing. In Daniel 9, Daniel talks about the fact that he was visited by the angel Gabriel. Gabriel came from heaven and spoke to Daniel and told him exactly when the Jewish Messiah would be revealed to Israel. You say, can that be true? It's almost absolutely true. In fact, he said there's going to be an event and uh, Jesus is going to be, or the Messiah will be revealed to Israel exactly 483 years after that event. And Gabriel told Daniel that the event was uh, specifically the event. He said, it is going to happen 483 years after the decree goes forth to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You see, Jerusalem was in shambles. It was in ruins. And the Jewish people were, um, were held captive and slaves in another country. And it came to pass, just like Gabriel said, 17 years after Gabriel visited Daniel's bedchambers and told him about this, this prophecy, 17 years later, Artaxerxes decreed that the walls of Jerusalem should be rebuilt. And he commissioned a man 
by the name of Nehemiah to accomplish it. You remember that story? And when that, we, have, we can go back to the history books and we can actually come down to the very day when Artaxerxes made that prediction. Google it, you'll find all this to be true. And then exactly 483 years later to the year, in fact, to the month, in fact, to the week, and in fact, some researchers have come to the conclusion to the very day, counting the Jewish years of 360 days per year, it's pretty complex when you get into it, but down to the year, the month, the week, maybe even the 24-hour period day, 483 years after Artaxerxes made the decree, 483 years exactly later, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey's colt with his followers shouting, Hosanna, and he goes into town. Dan, uh, Daniel said he shall then die, but not for himself. And he died that week, but not for himself. He died for you and he died for me. And he suffered for the sins of the whole world in a complete, direct, full fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9. Folks, that doesn't happen just happenstance. The Bible is real because the real author of the Bible is real and that is God Almighty who created us. The third evidence I have that causes me to believe in God is simply results. Come on, somebody. I mean, we got to look at the results, right? My experience has been that when I believe and obey the Bible, it works for me. I said, when I believe it and when I obey it, then it works. Now, if you don't believe it, it won't work for you. If you don't obey it, it won't work for you. If you just give it a shot here or there, it's not gonna work for you. But if you'll believe it and obey it consistently, I'm telling you the Bible will prove itself to you. It is the handbook for living. I'm thinking about the hundreds of people over my 40 years of passion, hundreds of people have testified to me that when they tried tithing like God challenges us to do in Malachi 3, he said, put me to the test, Prove me, it literally means, put me to the test, try me, see if I won't do it. He said, you, you bring all the tithe, you start bringing your tithe consistently to my house and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour blessing out into your life. And I've had hundreds of people tell me, it happened for me, Pastor David. It happened for me. I know people don't want me to talk about money, but I'm just talking about results. I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about results. <laughs> yeah results. You know, a person that won't try tithing, they may rob themselves of the, of, the, of the one opportunity they have to prove that God's real in their life. If you got doubts about God, I challenge you to tithe, try tithing. That's the one thing God said, well, just try this and see if I not, not open the he heavens and pour something out into your life. Yeah. I remember when I first discovered healing, that healing is still for today. I grew up not, not believing that. I wasn't taught that. In my early 20s, though, I was around some people that said, oh, God will still answer prayer. He'll, he'll still heal sick people. I said, really? And they, I started studying the scripture, started studying Isaiah's prophecies about the ministry of Jesus, Jesus' ministry. I discovered Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I began to, the evidence began to pile up, the scriptural evidence that if, that, listen, if God doesn't heal today, then there is no God. If God does not heal today, then the Bible is not true. The Bible never says that there was a day of miracles. It says there is a God of miracles and he's not dead. He's still alive. Amen? So I began to delve into these scriptures and began to believe them. And I, man, I made a decision. I not only want Jesus to be my savior, I want him to be my healer and I want him to be the healer of my household. And I want to be able to pray and see God move in my family. And that decision in my heart as I studied the healing promises came to a quick challenge. I came home after a midnight shift one morning and, and found that my little two-year-old firstborn, Nikki, was sick, had been sick all night, screaming, screaming, kept her mother all night, suffering. Took her to the doctor, found out she had strep throat, a horrible case of strep throat, and a stomach virus. Two illnesses. The doctor said, here, give her this medicine. If she's not better in 24 hours, you're gonna have to put her in the hospital. Man, we were scared, scared, scared. And I remembered those healing scriptures and I decided I'm, I'm gonna believe God. I, Jesus is a healer. 
I'm going to believe what the Bible says. To make a long story short, because I've told it the long way of many times, and recently, I think. But to make a long story short, I took her home, laid her in her baby bed, read that scripture over and over to myself, went into her baby bed, laid my hands on her, because Jesus said, believers, believers, not doubters, not atheists, not agnostics, believers, will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And I laid hands on Nikki. I said, God is healing you right now. I picked her up in my arms. I had prayed for her in the name of Jesus. I picked her up in my arms, went into the living room. I began to jump up and down and rejoice for her healing. I began to spin her around the room. She's sick. She's screaming bloody murder. Her eyes are red with bloodshot. She's got strep throat. And I'm jumping around with this sick baby. Oh, you'd have thought I was terrible that day. But I had faith that God's word was true. And I'm dancing around the living room. And all of a sudden, she stopped crying and started giggling. I looked at her eyes. They were white. I felt of her head, no fever. She'd been awake all night screaming. I sat her in her high chair. We were so poor, we didn't have any milk. All I had to feed her was dry cornflakes. I filled her little bowl up with dry cornflakes. She ate every bit of it, smiling, happy, healed by the power of God. Results prove there's a God in heaven. I said, results prove. The proof of the pudding, they I used to say, is in the eating. Results don't lie. I mean, that's even scientific. Everybody say results. results. Come on, say creation, creation. scripture, creation. Results. results. Here's number four. Miracles, I'm touching on that anyway. Miracles prove the existence of God. Miracles prove the existence of God. Just got back from Honduras. Hundreds of people healed every night. But I want to talk about a healing that happened back in February the 3rd. I was down there on a preparation uh, trip. And I was invited to preach in several churches. One of the churches was uh, early service on Sunday morning. I did two services. On the first service, I taught on healing and we prayed for the sick. Those services slammed up together just like ours. Didn't have time to pray for everybody. But we just prayed one prayer of faith. People all over the auditorium testified, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm I'm better, my pain left. It was a wonderful service. We dismissed the service, and this one lady from the back made a beeline toward me, a middle-aged nice lady. She came down. She wanted to talk to me. It's through the translator. She said, Pastor David, when you prayed, my ear was healed. I said, wonderful. What was wrong with your ear? She goes, it was deaf. I couldn't hear a thing out of this left ear. But now she could hear just as good out of her left ear as she could her right ear. I thought, that, well, that's great, praise God. She goes, that's, that's not all. I had two tumors in my stomach and they melted away when my ear came open. God healed my ear and he removed two tumors out of my stomach all in a moment of time. Now, I know what people think. I know what people say. They say, oh, that's a crazy lady. Huh? She's just crazy, crazy. <laughs> or like Nacho Libre said, That's crazy, (laughs) right? Yeah. Uh, She's a fanatic. She's a liar. She's just one of those preacher worshipers. She's just telling that preacher what he wants to hear. You know, that's possible. But I can tell you this. We've done 60 crusades down there, and in every single one of those 60 crusades, not one was left out. We had all kind of crazy, lying, fanatical ladies telling us I was healed of a tumor. I was healed of arthritis. I was healed of my cancer. My ear came open. I can see it when I was blind. I, 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 we've seen broken, the people testified broken bones were healed. They've taken their cast off and left them with us. They've thrown crutches and canes on the platform and walked home after these services. Folks, all of them can't be liars. All of them can't be just fanatics. All of them cannot be preacher worshipers just trying to tell a good story. Come on, somebody. Miracles prove that God exists. Miracles prove it. But then there's a a fifth, a fifth evidence that I want to share with you that I think is as real as creation, just as real as scripture, just as real as the results, and just as real as the miracles that I've seen and witnessed. It might be kind of a surprise to you, but I think this is an evidence of God. Necessity. I believe in God because I need God. I kind of have figured out that we were never meant to operate or function without Him. (laughs) Something just isn't quite right when you try to function and live your life without Him. 
I need him. I need him to be better than me. I mean, I need him to be able to make me better than I am without him. I, I need a God to make me bigger than I am. <laughs> I need a God because left to myself, I've discovered something about me. Now, don't, if you ask Carrie, she's too sweet. She'll never tell this on me, but I'm going to admit it myself. Left to myself, I'm selfish. Now, don't look at your spouse. Just think about you and me. <laughs> left to myself, I, I've discovered that I'm, I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. I'm self-focused. I'm self-indulgent. <laughs> when somebody wants to go to this restaurant, well, I, 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 I want to go, okay, well, go, yeah, but, but left to myself, I just want to go where I want to go, eat what I want to eat, do what I want to do, say what I want to say, and then excuse myself like humans do, you know. Well, that's just me. If they can't take me like me, then it's just... <laughs> No, that's the whole point of salvation is Jesus can make you unlike you and more like him. <laughs> yeah, without him, I'm dangerously and deceptively self-reliant. I need a God. I need someone to serve. I need someone to answer to. I need someone to judge me. I need somebody to worship besides me. Because without God, I'm like that fool David described. Me, David Brown, I'm the fulfillment of Psalm 14, 1. Without God, I'm a fool. I am evil. I do terrible things. <laughs> and I never really, really do what is right. I need him. Therefore, I, I believe in him. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap. There's a really sad, true life story in the life of a man by the name of Charles Templeton. He was a Canadian who was converted to faith in Jesus in the 1930s. He, he became an evangelist that very same year. I mean, he, he jumped right into ministry and Developed a name. He was a good looking man. He was a great speaker. And he joined up with the most revered evangelist of the 20th century, Billy Graham. And he and Billy Graham became friends and they ministered together. They did a whole European tour together in the 40s. They were close friends. But after a few years of ministry, Charles Templeton began to experienced challenges to his faith. He, he began to study the claims of science and the evolutionists and the Darwinists, the unbelievers, and liberal, modernistic theologies that discount miracles, discount the miracle of creation, discount the scripture, discount Jesus' healings, Jesus' resurrection. He began to have doubts, serious doubts. Doubts began to eat away at his soul. And he, 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 he understood that he was losing his grasp on faith. And he thought it, it was due to his lack of spiritual biblical education. He decided he would enroll in seminary, enrolled in Princeton Theological Seminary, hoping to prop up his faith. But in fact, the professors there kept eating away at his faith. And within a year of going to Princeton, he gave up his faith and became an agnostic. I don't know whether there's a God or not, he said. Later in 1996, he wrote a book called Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. He rejected the Christian faith in the late 40s. He died in 2001 as an agnostic. He never came back to his faith. It's a sad, sad story. Paul predicted this sort of thing, 1 Timothy 4.1. He said, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Folks, you gotta be in the faith to depart from the faith. Paul said the Spirit of God was saying even in his day, in the latter times, some people are gonna depart from the faith because they're gonna pay attention to seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons. See, seducing spirits are opposed to what the Holy Spirit says. 
And the doctrines of demons are opposed to the doctrines of the Holy Bible. Templeton began to be seduced by those spirits and taken in by those teachings of demonic spirits. And he gave up his faith. He said, farewell to God. Farewell to God. Two years before he died, Lee Strobel, you might recognize that name, he wrote The Case for Christ. Movies have come out now based on his book, The Case for Christ. He was an agnostic or an atheist, I've forgotten which, and he decided to study and research the historicity of the resurrection, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. And through his study and his research, he came to faith in Christ. He, he finally gathered by just studying the historical accounts of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. He discovered Jesus really did rise from the dead. The evidence was abounding and he became a Christian through his research. He came out of atheism, agnosticism, into faith. The very opposite of this man, Charles Templeton. So he became an interesting figure in Strobel's mind. He decided, I, I want to go and interview this man. So he made a trip to Canada, made an appointment, Mr. Templeton received his request, welcomed him into his home, and Lee Strobel interviewed this agno Christian who had become an agnostic. It's a very interesting, interesting thing to read about. In fact, I want to read a little bit of Lee Strobel's account of their meeting. Uh, the first thing he began to talk about with Mr. Templeton was his ideas about Jesus himself. Because it all, it, it all boils down to Jesus, right? And uh, so he said, uh, uh, I want to ask you if, or what you think about Jesus. Now, Mr. Templeton had not, had not gone into his unbelief without a meeting with Billy Graham. I want you to understand that. In fact, the two of them talked. He, he challenged Billy Graham's faith. He said, Billy, you, you, do you believe the, in the literal creation story of Genesis? He says, evolution is a demonstrable fact. Billy said, well, I don't accept that. Said, How can you not accept that? It's a demonstrable fact. He says, well, it disagrees with the Bible. I believe the Bible over your demonstrable facts. He said, well, you're committing intellectual suicide, Billy. Billy said, well, I'm going to go with the Bible. I found out when I preached the Bible, when I say God says and the Bible says it's powerful and people's lives are changed, I'm going to believe the Bible over everything else in this world. That's what Billy Graham decided. <laughs> Templeton said, no, I'm going with the other side of the story. So Strobel comes and he says, how do you assess this Jesus then? What do you think of Jesus? He said, it seemed like his uh, body language softened. He became relaxed. They'd had quite a talk up to this point. But this question softened Charles Templeton. And he said, uh, well... Jesus was the greatest human being who has ever lived. He was a moral genius. This is what Templeton the agnostic said. He, see, he accepted the fact that Jesus is a real historical figure. Folks, he really did live. History gives us much evidence of that. The Jesus is not the figment of somebody's imagination. There was a man who lived from Nazareth named Jesus. So we have to decide, was he right in what he thought and believed and taught? Or was he a maniac? Was he a liar? Was he mixed up? Everyone has to face that question. What do you make of Jesus? He said he's the greatest human being who ever lived. He was a moral genius. His ethical sense was unique. He was in, in, the intrinsically wisest person that I have ever encountered in my life or in my readings. His commitment was total and led to his own death. Now, he didn't believe in the resurrection, but he, know, he knew Jesus died. He said, what... What could one say about him except that this was a form of greatness? Lee Strobel said, I was taken aback. I said, you sound like you really care about him. Well, yes, Templeton said. He is the most important thing in my life. I, 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 he stuttered. I know it might sound strange, but I have to say, I adore him. Everything good I know, everything decent I know, everything pure I know, I learned from Jesus. Yes, 
Yes, Jesus. There's no question that he had the highest moral standard, the least duplicity, the greatest compassion of any human being in history. There has been many other wonderful people, but Jesus is Jesus. He said, in my view, he is the most important human being that has ever existed. That's when Templeton uttered the words I never expected to hear from him. He said, and if I may, put it this way. And then his voice began to crack and his eyes filled with tears. And Templeton said, I miss him. And then he turned away and put his hand up and shielded his tears from Lee Strobel and heaved and cried. And when he finally got control of himself, he turned back to him and said, enough of that. And wouldn't talk about it anymore. Folks, let me tell you something. We do not have to miss him. We can believe in him. I believe in him. I believe I have the evidence to believe in him. Even the evidence of an agnostic that can't get over his relationship with him. Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, God in the flesh, is real. Not was, he is raised from the dead. He's alive right now at the right hand of God. And everything he said is true. Everything he said is true. Can I tell you about Jesus? Jesus. (laughs) Jesus is the one who created. For the Bible says not anything was made that was made without him making it. Jesus. He believed the scriptures of the Old Testament. He said, if you can't believe Moses' words, how can you believe in me? Jesus believed in results and got results in his life. Jesus believed in miracles and worked miracles in front of the very eyes during his earthly ministry. Jesus told us that you and I need God. He said, you must, you must be born again. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Don't you know no one comes to God except through me. He said, it's a must to come through him and to become a believer in God. I believe in God. I sure hope you do too. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's all stand up. We're going to pray together. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap. We've got evidence. (laughs) Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and I want you to answer this question. Do you believe in God? And of course, the answer for most of us is yes. Everybody shout yes if you believe in God. Do you believe in Jesus, his son? Do you believe he is the way to God and there is no other? Then what will you do with him? Will you believe in him? Will you follow him? Will you take him at his word? The most wonderful human being that ever lived No wonder, because he was God in a human body. God who is love. God who is holy. God who is so pure. So crystal clearly pure. That he cannot lie. And he will not sin, nor will he tempt you. challenge you today to take the evidence at face value and determine in your own life, I do have faith in God. Like Jesus said, I have faith in God. Again, every head bowed, every eye closed. Now the question is, what will you do with Jesus? Will you follow him? Will you commit your life to him? Will you trust his blood to wash away your sins? Will you Ask him to come into your heart and make you a born-again child of God. That's the only proper response of faith. If if we're going to believe in God, we must believe what he said and believe it without any doubt. 
and act upon that faith. Well, I've found when I believe and obey the Bible, it works for me and it'll work for you. While every head is bowed, every eye is closed, I would like to ask you if there's anyone or several someones here in this service this morning and you've decided today, I want to follow Jesus, I'm going to commit my life to him. If that's your desire, I want to pray with you. But would you right now put them up real high so I can see you in the lights. Put your hand up real high. I'm going to commit my life to Jesus today and become his follower. I'm going to come to him. Put your hand up real high right now all over the room, all over the room. Put it up real high, real high. I am going to follow Jesus. This is a new decision on your, on your a, a brand new step of faith. Thank you. I see that hand. One. Two, three, four, five. Thank you. You're not alone, see. You're not alone. Up in the balcony, put your hand up. Anyone? Five. I'm going to ask those five people, would you take a bold step? Come on, would you do what Billy Graham said he did? I just going to believe the Bible, and he began to preach it and act upon it. Would you step out of your seat and come right down front, and we're going to pray together right here in the front. Five. There's five of you at least. Come on right now. Come on right now and just meet me down front. We're going to pray quickly and we're going to help you. And it, it's going to be good. There's five of you come right now. Keep on clapping while they come. Can I have another hand mic? Come right here with me. Come on, I'm proud of you. Come right here, hon. Come on, oh, there's at least five of you. At least five of you. Bless you. Man. Thank you, hon. Come here, young people. Look at these young'uns. All right, all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, we've gained one. What a good investment this has been. Anybody else? Come on, I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. There's another little one. God bless you, hon. You're so pretty. My goodness, you're pretty. Anybody ever told you that? Yes, I think they have. Anybody else? You're going to be prettier here in just a minute. Everybody's going to be prettier on the inside. Anybody else? I'll wait 30 more seconds, please. Jesus said, if you'll confess me before man, I'll confess you before the Father. Faith is not just a thought. Faith is an action. Faith is not just in your head. It's in your heart, and it swells, and it takes over your life, and it causes you to begin to follow. Taking that step and walking right down front is the first step to actually following Jesus. you got to do it publicly. You have to. You have to be able to say it with your mouth and act upon it with your body. That's what true Christianity is. It's not just nice thoughts or just believing in God's existence. No, it's actually accepting the gift of His salvation through His Son, believing that what He did on the cross was for you, believing that He's really alive from the dead. That's Christianity. Anybody else? Let's all bow our heads then. Let's, let's give these guys a reverent moment. And folks, I'm going to help you with this prayer. You just mean it in your heart. We're just inviting Jesus in to do what He said He would do. Because the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, reborn, forgiven, given new life. You'll become a child of God. As many as received him, the Bible says, to them he gave the power to become a child of God. We're believing together. Let's pray these words. Everybody help them. Say it out loud. Jesus, I believe in you. You are God. You came to this earth. You lived a perfect life. And then you died. But not for yourself. You died for me. You took my place. You took my punishment for all of my sins. I'm sorry I've sinned. I turn away from sin. I don't want to live that way. I want to follow you, Jesus. I want you to make me better. Come into my heart. Make me your child. Make me born again right now by faith. I trust you. And today I'm following you for the rest of my life. Thank you for forgiving me and saving me and making me your child. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Guys, would you go with Patrick, this good-looking man here? I, I got some things to give you. He's going to keep you about two or three minutes. That's all. Go with him, please, right now. And uh, we rejoice with you. Come on, give these guys a hand clap. Aren't you glad they came today? 
Everybody say it out loud. Everybody say, I have faith in God. I believe in God. And I believe in Jesus. And I'm his follower. Amen. Praise the Lord.